Please take your seats so that we can uh, start the second and last day of our plenary. Um, before we resume our work, I would like to inform you that there will be several voting sessions of opinions and amendments today. The first one the first one is scheduled from 10.20 to 10.50. Thank you. The first one scheduled from 10.20 to 10.50 a.m. The second one from 11.50 to 1 a.m. The third one from 3.20 to 4.20 p.m. Followed by the vote on the resolution at 4.20 p.m. These voting slot timelines are approximate and uh, may vary, of course, in practice. So please make sure that you are in the room or in front of your computer and ready to vote when the time comes. We start our day with a very interesting and high-level debate on the promotion of European democratic values through education to foster EU citizenship. I have the pleasure today to welcome with us for this debate the Vice President of the European the Vice President for the European Commission for Democracy and Demography, Mr. Bravka Suica, our good friend and strong ally of the committee. And of course, Ms. Inge Sieben, Associate Professor in the Tilburg University, Mr. Dominic Ruiz Vanessa, Rapporteur on the Implementation of Citizenship Education Actions, Member of the European Parliament. So, dear Vice President Suica, dear Member of the European Parliament, Devesa, dear colleagues, during these very challenging times, we truly realize the importance of strong, strong European democracies that are built on solid European values. We the local and regional leaders and the local and regional authorities play indeed a vital role in promoting European values and encouraging citizens' participation in democratic processes. These are crucial for countering the multiplying threats of democracy and should form an essential element within the education for all EU citizens. Now, these values can also be promoted in education in a bottom-up manner, in full respect of subsidiarity. And our regional and local elected members have launched a pilot project in this sense. And I also know that the European Parliament has adopted the resolution on citizenship education. So together, we can harness the power of education to make the European Union better understood and, of course, to build a common European identity, which is expressed through the European citizenship. Because European citizenship is about fundamental rights and freedoms, freedoms of movement, of residence, and rights that, of course, come with it. But it is also about responsibility, you know, and obligations. It is about building ownership, since it must be an expression of a shared commitment to our European democratic values, which, in turn, must also be proven by votes at local, regional and national elections and, of course, at the approaching European elections. Now, for all these reasons, in today's context, it is really crucial to show how the European Union matters to all of us, our families, our lives, our everyday lives. 
All this is also in line with the objectives of the Working Group on European Democracy within the context of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Increasing citizens' participation and youth involvement in democracy and developing a full civic experience for Europeans as widely supported by the citizens' panels and in conference proposals. So to this end, we join the call for the introduction of a European curriculum for civic education, which includes the promotion of European values, critical thinking and media literacy and knowledge about our union. Now, in many of our members' regions and cities, there are already numerous good practices which our members have already shared with us. So I would like to thank warmly all those who contributed because these good practices can now be consulted on our web page. Before we open the debate, one last word to Vice President Suica. Vice President, I really want to thank you for your leadership as a co-chair in this conference on the future of Europe. We, local and regional leaders, feel that this might be the last opportunity for Europe to finally change, become more democratic, more transparent, more open, closer to its citizens. And I believe that under your leadership, this dialogue throughout these months has shown the interest of the citizens to make these changes. And I want you to know that not only do we recognize your crucial role in the involve, involving discussion in the Conference on the Future of Europe, but we also are certain that from now on you will be next to the Committee of Regions, as you, has, you have always been, in order to make sure that this House finds its way through these changes in order to make it a stronger house politically that will help the European Union bring Brussels, Strasbourg back to the everyday lives of citizens and at the same time the citizens closer to Europe. So we are here, we are, as you already know, your strong friends and allies and uh, do know that all of these members representing the 240 regions and the 90,000 municipalities of Europe are here to help strengthen our common house, the European Union and Europe. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words. Uh, thank you for this invitation. Uh, as you know, I was a mayor once, and uh, <laughs> once a mayor, always mayor, so I, I can understand both this local and regional level, and uh, I'm trying now from this level to somehow comprise all this, uh, all, the, all your wishes and all your uh, Pleas, uh, which, which we heard during uh, this uh, uh, process of Conference of the Future of Europe, especially in the Working Group on Democracy, and uh, we will be, we are trying to incorporate all this in final conclusions. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> Uh, you know that, uh, as I already said, I insist on making our democracy and democratic institutions that, that underpin, underpin it fit for the future. This is what we are saying all the time. This is not only the motto, but we have to adapt our democracy to be fit for the future. This requires a comprehensive approach. It requir requires looking at our values because values will inform exactly what kind of a democracy we want to strengthen. Do we want a democracy that empowers citizens to ensure they remain at its heart? Do we want a reimagined democracy that embraces change and innovation? How and when can citizens of all ages be empowered and provided with all necessary tools to engage in their democracy. We must future-proof our democracy. 
make, make it a healthy and safe place for people of all generations to come together to share their common future at all levels, local, regional, national and European, across borders and across languages, across cultures and across histories, leaving no one and nowhere behind. As I said at uh, our recent meeting in Marseille, local and regional authorities and European Committee of the Regions have been instrumental in bringing the Conference on the Future of Europe to citizens. As we move forward to the feedback phase, I trust that we can remain close partners, as I already said. Citizens must recognize their efforts and input in the proposals coming out from the conference. This gives legitimacy to the whole process of the conference. The conference is an important step in making our democracy again fit for the future, Conference on the Future of Europe. The success of the conference will be measured on the concrete results that we can deliver for our citizens. The European Commission has committed to follow up swiftly to the conference conclusions and is already carefully examining each recommendation and each proposal. But we will need you to reach out to the citizens to show them that the European Union is engaging with their proposals and acting on them. We will only be able to reach everyone in partnership with you. You cannot do it from Commission's level. I hope you understand. I will co-chair the last conference plenary taking place tomorrow and Saturday in Strasbourg. The plenary will put forward proposals on nine topics discussed over the last year. Citizens' engagement, inclusion in the policy-making process, civic education in, the policy, uh, in democratic processes, as well as European values and the history of Europe. These are some of the ideas that feature prominently in our draft proposals. I know that the European Committee of the Regions has supported calls for the introduction of civic education, as your president already mentioned. As a former mayor and as a teacher myself, I very much welcome your call to promote European values, identities and citizenship through education and culture at regional and local level. Active citizenship is not a given. It must be nurtured. It is our common responsibility to ensure that this important attitude, a virtue in its own right, is part of education from the very early stages and through the whole lives. Informed discussions need informed citizens. In my work on demography, I look at all generations. When it comes to strengthening our democracy, we need to look at how we can help all generations to become more engaged, not only young people, but of course, the highlight is on young people. This lies at the very heart of civic education and at the very base of strong democracies. At the European Union level, we are engaging all means at our disposal to achieve this goal. Besides other long-lasting Erasmus Plus actions targeting young people, we have opened up the Jean Monnet program further beyond higher education, because we also want to give the opportunity to younger Europeans to learn about the European Union. With the new Jean Monnet actions, learners from primary and secondary level onwards can now benefit from improved teaching about the European Union, its institutions, and how our policies benefit their daily life. What we hope to achieve with the Jean Monnet program is to add a European dimension to the active citizenship young people build up throughout their schooling. I have seen in the conference that as citizens became better informed about the European Union, they started feeling more committed to the problem. When it comes to the education, the more informed and better educated citizens are, the more likely they will engage and take ownership of their democracy at all stages of their life. To help with this, citizens have access to the EU Learning Corner of the, on the School Education Gateway. It is an online platform for school education with a rich and broad offer of information and training courses. In addition, it provides a number of resources to support the integration of young, young Ukrainian refugees into the education systems of member states and also Erasmus Plus countries, a vital resource in the current circumstances. 
Education and research also play an important role in upholding the rule of law. On the 18th of January, the Commission adopted the package on higher education. The package emphasizes how universities have a unique position at the crossroads of education, research, innovation, serving society and economy. Indeed, they are key actors to promote values such as the rule of law, human rights and international norms and standards. Member States are called on to protect, to nurture and to defend these values through their policies and funding opportunities including ensuring the protection of research against foreign interference. Under Horizon 2020, EU research project on democracy and governance received over 800 million euros of funding. Under the new Horizon Europe program for the period 2021 to 2027, the Commission will continue to fund such research. Dear members, dear ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, just a few weeks ago, I joined you in Marseille, where we discussed building the house of European democracy. It must be the place where every citizen can find their home. It is vital that the Commission and the European Committee of the Regions continue working closely together on this. After all, it is local councillors who are best placed to reach citizens. The Conference of the Future of Europe is another brick in the house of European democracy. On the 9th of May, on Day of Europe, the final report of the conference will be presented to the three presidents in Strasbourg, President of the Commission, President of the Parliament, President of the Council. We will be joined there by citizens of all ages and backgrounds. It will be an important moment to take stock of what the citizens are proposing to us to work on our for, uh, on, uh, what, uh, what citizens are proposing for us for our common future. The Conference of the Future of Europe is a celebration of our values. We are a union based on the respect on, for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. We can see the values of Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union in practice throughout every component of the conference. We have created a space for free debate and deliberation in contrast to the brutal events in Ukraine. Indeed, the current unjustified and unprovoked aggression by the Kremlin remind us, reminds us that we can never take our democracy for granted. We have to work on it together, every day, at all levels. We need to reach contribution and participation of the 1.1 million elected representatives at the local level. We must, we must get it is right if we want to build a democracy that is worthy of its name. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President Suica. Let me now give the floor to the Member of the European Parliament, Dominic Rules de Vesa, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, dear President uh, Chichi Costas of the Committee of the Regions. It is a pleasure to accept your invitation and to continue working together as we have done also with the Belle project and uh, the network of uh, councillors on EU matters, which I think is a really a strategic um, bet that we are doing, um, and also glad to be with Vice President Suica and um, uh, our colleague from the Tilburg University and honourable members of the Committee of the Regions. If you allow me, I will switch to Spanish to deliver my comments. Aprovecho también el arranque. I'd also like to begin by thanking the President for one of the points at the start of his intervention which uh, really touched me and that is the support that you expressed for our proposal, the European Parliament proposal. I was uh, the rapporteur and it was adopted uh, by the vast majority in the plenary on democracy and citizenship education. This is something that uh, was 
something that came from the work uh, on the uh, conference on the future of Europe uh, in the group on education and democracy. I think there's clearly collective demand to strengthen this dimension in education. And I'd also like to raise uh, the question of education of values, uh, education uh, on citizenship, and place it in the geopolitical context, because I think there has been a feeling that uh, this is a fairly soft subject matter. And as we all know, the European Union doesn't have strong powers uh, in this area. We are there to provide support, uh, coordination, uh, but uh, I think that there is a geopolitical dimension to this, and this ties in with some things uh, that were said by Vice President uh, Suica and uh, by our President here of the Committee of the Regions. If we look at what's happening in Ukraine and the east of Europe, the whole uh, issue of... Uh, misinformation, uh, which started way before uh, the war from Putin, but not just Putin, the lack of understanding of the EU, lack of knowledge about the EU and really about democracy in general. This is something that puts us uh, really on uh, the back foot when it comes to our adversaries. If we look at how the world uh, is now, we've entered into this new uh, phase uh, with uh, democracies set off against uh, autocracies. And I think that, uh, of course, the first thing with democracy is empowering all our citizens. And our citizens, therefore, need to sufficiently understand uh, just how one lives in a democracy, how one acts in a democracy, uh, how with empowered citizenship uh, you can act in order to face up to all of these threats and also to be able to act in a world which is globalised, interdependent, where the most significant challenges are transnational uh, in nature, security and defence, of course, but also uh, there's climate change, uh, which was maybe more important uh, in the past, although it's still relevant now, but it's been overtaken by events in Ukraine. Also inequalities, migration, all of these are transnational challenges. Therefore, education on citizenship has to be a multi-level form of education because uh, the, the governance, the democracy is multinational. It's local, it's regional, it's national and transnational. And in that respect, uh, what uh, we have been doing, and here I appreciate uh, what was said by the Vice President of uh, the European Commission, and I know that she's taken note of our opinion and the work that's been done in the Conference on the Future of Europe, but uh, also, as the President of the Committee of the Regions has said, we need to be more ambitious in this field. Our impression and in the opinion uh, before the recommendations we carry out a diagnosis and analysis of the situation and we see that there are many initiatives Erasmus Plus as Vice President mentioned uh, financing uh, different uh, citizenship uh, projects uh, and uh, the programme for schools but nonetheless despite that I think we're caught uh, in this paradigm of an exchange of best practices and uh, funding of individual projects. Uh, OK, maybe a fairly high number of projects, uh, but they are fairly scattered, uh, fairly piecemeal. And what we really identified, pinpointed in our opinion, is the need to move uh, to a more systemic approach, to one where we look at the structural impact. And I think they are the main... Uh, idea and this is not something that uh, should be done in an office uh, by a Eurocrat. Uh, this is a collective effort. Uh, all of us have to get involved. Uh, all of us who have uh, responsibilities in the area of education, not just the states. In many countries, it's the regions that have this responsibility, this competence. But collectively, we have to take this project forward so that member states can then implement all of this, uh, as the Vice President said, in respect of subsidiarity. And 
Of course, we have a slight dilemma in this respect and just how, with this initiative, can we ensure that uh, as many people as possible, everybody can benefit uh, from this. I think uh, we all have a shared uh, destiny and therefore, and, and we know that uh, European citizenship is recognised uh, in the treaty, therefore we have to really have the inspiration that everybody, all European children have access to this education. Uh, it's a strategic and geopolitical question, as I said at the outset. But I think it would be highly regrettable if we were to have member states uh, that were to decide to take this approach and others not. I, I, I really don't think that that makes uh, sense. And uh, what would happen as well if we were to have one member state who wanted to, to take this uh, the, the other way round uh, with... with uh, the citizenship uh, education. I mean, we'll all recall uh, a, a Polish minister who said that they wanted uh, schools in Poland to explain that uh, the EU was an oppressor uh, and was uh, creating a new form of Soviet Union. So we have to make sure that it's addressed the right way round and not uh, abused or misused in that way. We have to make sure that uh, this education is available to all children across the European Union. On many occasions here we've uh, talked about the democratic deficit of the European Union, democratic deficit uh, looking at uh, the powers of the institutions, the Parliament, the Council, and it's true that we need to reinforce that and many ideas have come out uh, from the Conference on the Future of Europe. But I think even before we go into the question of uh, the democratic deficit, there is this shortfall in terms or deficit in terms of uh, understanding knowledge of the European Union and education and there there are other possibilities I think which we could explore and implement you don't need to necessarily uh, change uh, the treaty uh, but uh, we have the curriculum proposals uh, but we could also develop a European citizenship uh, strategy uh, education citizenship and develop a framework of competences and skills in this area we've got uh, competency frameworks in other areas and science and uh, all the other uh, subject areas of the curriculum, but not in the area of citizenship. And I don't want to go on at too much length, but maybe I could just end with one final thought. The EU has uh, programmes, uh, the uh, Solidarity Corps, the Erasmus programme, uh, different uh, training uh, and mobility programmes that are offered to young people with EU funding. But I think we could also take advantage, uh, as Vice President has said, if we were to take a more systemic and structural approach and we were to take um, more seriously this uh, citizenship education target. Uh, so people who benefit from these training mobility programmes, it would be good if they were required as part of this uh, training, if they were to be required to follow a citizenship module. I think with that, uh, we would really be able to reach a much broader audience, or a, a massive uh, audience, uh, and not just, uh, as I said, uh, have uh, financing of individual projects and the best exchange of practices. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor now to Inge Sieben, the Associate Professor from the Tilburg University. Yes, thank you, and thank you for inviting me here to talk about one of the projects financed by the European Union. Um, I'm the coordinator of an Erasmus Plus project, eValue, and together with my colleagues from Tilburg University and also from partner um, universities, uh, in Belgium, Netherlands, Slovakia and Turkey, we are working on European values education. And um, the driver for this project actually is the need for citizenship education. And as mentioned already, this is voiced by local, regional, national, European authorities and has already led to changes in curricula in many countries. But still we observe, and also this is backed up by research, we find that schools 
uh, find it difficult to implement these curriculum changes, and also teachers are struggling to uh, teach about controversial issues. So in the project, uh, we have uh, developed teaching materials and interactive tools on five contemporary themes, and democracy is one of them. And uh, it's crucial to note that this is all based on scientific insights. So uh, we have data from the European Value Study and other surveys to show pupils uh, the opinions of people in Europe. Um, and we can also link it to theoretical and scientific debates. Uh, and one of them is the cultural backlash debate. And I think this is crucial because you are talking about engaging all generations in the citizenship education, which is very important. But what we see in research is that especially the younger cohorts, they are um, uh, having a somewhat lower level of democratic values. So if you ask them about democracy, the older generations, and especially the middle generation, the baby boomers or people born in the 50s and 60s, they ha have higher democratic values than the younger generations. And that makes it crucial to focus indeed on the young generation as well. So you can see here this graph, which is ongoing research that we do. Um, so I will briefly discuss the tools that we developed and then uh, uh, discuss and explain how this can be, uh, how this can foster European education, European value education, and also democratic values. So the first tool we developed, uh, you can all find it on atlasofeuropeanvalues.eu. It's working on your mobile, so you can go there. And what you can do is create your own maps based on data from the European Value Study, but also European Social Survey and World Value Study. Um, and uh, it will show you the, the public opinion on important topics. For example, we have a map showing the importance of having a, a country ruled uh, democratically. And you can see that there are differences between countries. And you can also compare maps. So I have here a map on the left for young people and on the right for older people. And again, you can see that older people find this a little bit more important than younger people. And this is an interactive tool that is very, uh, students like this very much, to play with it. Um, then the teacher can create an old, an, a classroom and then students can answer survey questions themselves. For example, on this question, how important do you think it is to be ruled uh, democratically? or how, how much trust, how much confidence do you have in Parliament? And by doing this, they position themselves. They say what their own opinion is. And they will, in the class, they can show it in such a graph. Uh, your own position from the student will be green on his own screen. The, the position of the students is anonymous, but it will foster some discussion and some, yeah, thinking about why do I position myself in this way? How do I relate to others? Uh, and, and that's also a way to do it. You can also do it um, to compare different classes, so in, in a digital exchange, uh, to bring up discussion. And again, you can compare it to the public opinions of people in Europe, and also maybe different groups, young, old, men, women, high educated, low educated. Finally, we have a lot of teaching materials developed, and we also provide then theoretical background reports to help students and teachers to explain the differences or the patterns that we see in these values. Um, one of these elements is that we also have an Atlas of European Values, a physical book that has also these explanations in that. And we will present it on Europe Day 9th in Brussels. The, f that's the, the first copy will be handed over there. Um, okay, um, I also wanted to stress that uh, what is important is two things. In uh, values education, we focus on uh, values clarification, which means that students know that there are a variety of opinions possible and that there are patterns in this as well. So there are similarities and differences. And how do these differences come about? That's one part. And the second part is values communication, which means for students to, to understand where do I stand? What is my position? And what are my arguments for this position? And both things uh, really help 
to foster democratic values because, as I said, we are based this on research, so not only social research on explaining the differences, but also pedagogical insights. And these show us that some strategies are more, are more effective than other strategies. For example, an open classroom climate is crucial. And if we, we pick strategies that foster this open climate, and that also research shows, increases students' appreciation of conflict, which means that they appreciate different opinions, yeah? and that is crucial in democracy. We have different opinions. We argue why we have these opinions, and then we come to the best solution. And it also shows that it increases uh, political participation, for example, voting behavior. So if you pick the right strategies, you can increase democratic values. That's it for now. Thank you very much. And uh, I have to admit this is an outstanding work. And I also want to congratulate you, Professor, but also the rector of your university, our former uh, member and good friend of mine, Vin van den Donk, who really has uh, uh, done an outstanding work in the university, but also uh, here in the Committee of Regions. So, uh, dear colleagues, we will now move to uh, our debate, and uh, we will open the floor to our members. And we will start with uh, Emil Bock from the APP. Mr. President, dear Vice President of the European Commission, <laughs> Madam Schwitza, dear colleagues, the EPP strongly supports the quality investment in education and education as a key political priority of the European Union. The future of our European project depends to a large extent on quality investment in education. Also, we need a highly quality, inclusive and accessible digital education in Europe. Education is an investment with long-term benefits. Education is the key to get out of poverty and to get access to prosperity. Education has a major role in promoting and defending democracy. We have to take our democracy very seriously, to teach it, to debate it, to improve it, and last but not least, to defend it. Democracy can be destroyed from the outside, but from the inside too, by populists and demagogues. Education is a vaccine for populism, intolerance, racism, violence and fake news. Education must equip all young people with skills and aptitudes not only for employment, but also for a democratic way of life. I do support so much the citizen proposals on the conference on the future of Europe about integrating soft skills in all the courses in the curricula in schools. By soft skills, one means listening to each other, encourage dialogue, resilience, understanding, respect and appreciation for the others, critical thinking, self-study, remaining curious, result-orientated. The EPP strongly supports the implementation of the European Education Area by 2025, the Digital Education Action Plan, and the European strategy for the universities as key factors to promote education and democratic values in Europe. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Prime Minister. I would like to give the floor now to Jelena. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and uh, dear Vice President Suisha and, and uh, other uh, guests and members. And I'm really pleased and honored uh, to address you in this debate. And one more, I want to also to thank you for the support of the work uh, the, of the Committee of Regions, but also as uh, your outstanding uh, advocacy towards the role of the subnational levels of the government in decision-making process of the European Union, and also working with the Conference of the F Future, it's impressive. But to be today's debate goes beyond policies, it's about politics, and also about the fundamentals of our people's feeling that being a part of a community that starts locally, but also grows up to reaching Europe and the world beyond it. And I believe that the mindful exercise of the citizenships is above all based on the feeling of the ownership and trust, 
trust is a key word, but also awareness of its own role in society. And uh, we could see that from the professor showing uh, how, how important that is to be a part of a society. Um, and also, uh, to, to forge a strong and resilient European society, we need to make that in a way that education meets more and more the needs of the labor market. And I would like to say that the pandemic, and now the war, has made Europe rethink about moving back a lot of industries and research and other things from other parts of the world. But we also need to have the skilled, trained people uh, to, to fill these workplaces. And uh, skilling, reskilling, and upskilling, that's really a model of lifelong uh, um, learning. And it starts at early ages, but it never ends. Uh, but it also helps defining uh, themselves as responsible, self-oriented citizens who contribute to the well-being of the communities through a productive life. But I would also say the digital and green transitions are also uh, oriented in, in a such sense. And uh, I would also like to, to mention the growing sense of uncertainty between young people about the directions that life would take. And um, there has been a global shift, I think we all agree, and, and you showed us that. So we really have to, to build this together. And I think that the pandemic has taught us some lessons. I think this war has taught us uh, more. But I think that together, uh, working on these values um, and uh, also uh, other things that we can do together is crucial. So I'm going to stop there and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter Kaiser, please, from the PS Group. President, ladies and gentlemen, the situation is even more dramatic than we realized. Since the 1990s, there has been a rolling back of democracy in many countries. And uh, well, we have uh, good reason to be worried about decay and decline. We have to, of course, um, encourage uh, more prosperity, peace. And we have to make sure that this spreads. Democracy is not self-evident. We have to work for it. We have to defend it where it is in jeopardy. And we have to hand it on to the next generation. I know that uh, an interest in democracy begins in one's earliest years as children. We have to use schools and other such institutions in order to uh, promote democracy. Education is the crucial to develop democratic structures and values. We have to be aware of this. Education in the EU has to be accessible to all. It also has to be a factor which uh, is inclusive, which works for um, uh, integrity and including all. We will not be able to defend our democracy if we don't do this. I think uh, democracy is a lifelong process. Democracy will always have to uh, face various challenges. We've heard about some of them today. I think that in particular the uh, European citizenship education will be a very crucial component for any future development in our democracy. We have to take what is common to us, our values, and we have to work on this. Democracy is made up of rights, but also duties. The European Union, too, has these rights and duties. So it is essential that we develop this further. We need to strengthen our European identity. The debate yesterday uh, on Ukraine showed us how democracy uh, is uh, worth defending 
as against other forms of government. We have to work in this spirit. We have to have democratic structures which inspire confidence and trust. I would like to go into one more point which is very important to me, and that is that pupils, students, have to be regarded as the bearers of democracy for the next generation. In my region, Carinthia, which is on the border with Slovenia and Italy, we are the first region in the EU which in our um, constitution uh, has laid down parliaments for young people. They are to meet at least four times a year and they are meant to um, help young people develop democratic structures further. I very much welcome that we are starting this initiative and I'd like to appall, appeal to others across all of the parties to take this task very seriously because this is uh, a question of values for which many people have died. I would now like to uh, say that democracy is a daily combat. Let's start now. Thank you. Thank you soon. The floor now to Ulrika Landergren. Thank you, Chair. In, I would like to talk for the Renew group. Education is the best way to increase democracy. We all know that we have a, a deficit in democracy and there are fewer people who get engaged in political parties or democratic institutions. Between 0.5 to 1 percent of me um, uh, citizens are members of a political party. We can't get the youth to engage why. We always say that the democracy has to be gained by every generation and have we taken responsibility for next generation. There are very good examples on how local politicians are trying to engage, uh, educate uh, young people in democracy. We have a youth uh, municipality council where we propose uh, changes and we also have youth uh, dialogues and so on. We have a long list. In my municipality, Kungsbacka, we have worked with youth councils several years where the young people vote for proposals that they want us to carry through. And Every year we give them follow-up. Uh, it could be the quality of uh, uh, food in school. Uh, it could be um, bus tickets. It could be skate parks. But you can't get everything. And then you understand how the democracy works. It's very important to uh, have a follow-up to the, uh, the young people. And we can also uh, see the changes in our views. And this, yes, it means more work for us politicians. It demands more from us politicians, but it rewards us a lot. And thank you, the representative from the university, that you talk about this as a tool where you engage the young people so they actually participate. This is how you understand democracy and this is what you do when you create a dialogue. We have to be better in Europe. Many of you have said that we have to introduce European values in education, in primary, secondary, at the university. We always need to uh, continue teach about European values. It should be obvious, but it isn't, and we have to uh, improve that. In the Conference of the European Future, we have listened and we've uh, received many proposals from the young generation, many very good, concrete proposals. And now it's time for us to show that we've actually listened to our citizens and our uh, uh, young people. Therefore, I'd like to put you a question, and there the microphone gone. The question is, how are you going to uh, follow up these proposals? 
we have to create a fit for future, and we're happy to participate in this. Floor now to Mr. The floor now to Mr. Bianchi, please. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much, President, uh, Commissioner, Speakers. We can't talk about uh, promoting uh, so-called European values without reflecting on the real meaning of these values for our citizens. We can't continue discussing how to promote a European citizenship without addressing the crucial question of European identity. Despite the fact that the founding fathers of Europe were very proud and aware of the values that unite the peoples of Europe. Today we are faced with a denial process uh, that is uh, turning against our culture, promoting a very different uh, set of values. We have uh, now uh, arrived at a crucial point in a debate, and I think I certainly believe uh, that uh, we have to uh, base ourselves on uh, the uh, Greek, uh, the uh, Roman, uh, the uh, Jewish, the Christian uh, values of Europe. We together are a mix of cultures, uh, peoples and nations, and we have to have uh, united and diversity truly as our European motto. And uh, we have to move away from the centralised rhetoric that is imposing uh, uh, view uh, on, on others that is a downward uh, spiral. We have to make sure that uh, we educate all of our young people, as was proposed uh, in the Conference on the Future of Europe, particularly in the working group that I was a member of. But there is also a real need to uh, have uh, grassroots projects uh, that encourage uh, exchanges between young people and ensure cohesion between the future generations of Europeans. And uh, rather than cancelling out our common trend, traditions and our European identity, we have to promote uh, those. And in fact, the regions have the best instruments to do that. Uh, ensuring that there's full respect of the principle of subsidiarity includes uh, making sure that uh, competences are properly uh, distributed uh, at national level and uh, make sure that uh, education, uh, which is uh, something that is often at regional level, is uh, properly discussed uh, that we have uh, these discussions with the local and regional authorities along with the competent national authorities. I'd like to conclude by saying that promoting citizenship uh, of the European Union can only happen with full respect of the member states and the local uh, territories. And it's only in being united in diversity that European citizens will be able to meet the challenges of the future and avoid divisions uh, and good cultural uh, erosion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCarthy, please. Yeah, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, dear Commissioner, I'm not too sure if you're an ABBA fan um, or if you've had a chance to listen to the new album, Voyage. Um, and in that particular album, there's a song called Ode to, Free Ode to, Ode to Freedom, O-D-E, to Freedom. And one of the lines goes, I would like to think that freedom is more than just a word. In the grand and lofty language, odes to freedom often go unheard. Um, and I'd like to think that many odes to freedom have been front and centre of the working group and plenary debates in the Conference of the Future of Europe, of which I'm one of the 30 representatives from here. I think the 178 conference recommendations are rich with crucial ideas which need to be implemented, or any recommendations where work is already ongoing within the European Commission, that such work would actually be enhanced. Um, reference has been made to the Democracy Working Group, um, but there are references to citizen programmes right across all nine uh, working groups when you actually read the 178 um, uh, proposed recommendations. I would like to take the opportunity to refer to the work, to, to the work of the Working Group on Education, uh, Culture, Youth and Sport, in which I sit with two other members uh, within, the, within the Committee of the Regions. Uh, we have offered full support to the citizens' recommendations. Um, many of them tally and align what the thinking of the Committee of the Regions. Um, if you take Cluster 1, for example, established by 2025, an inclusive uh, education, European education area, that's something that we completely agree with. Cluster 2 on addressing the specific needs of young people across all relevant policies, we agree with that. Cluster 3, promoting a culture of exchange and fostering European identity and European diversity through European exchanges, promoting, promoting multilingualism, European uh, diversity, um, uh, promoting cultural professionals, we all agree with that, and also Cluster 4, sport is also really, really important. All four clusters, just within the really important. Um, 
We are very, very worried, or the Committee of the Regions, of what's going to happen to many of the 178 recommendations beyond this weekend, because with regret, regret, the Committee of the Regions isn't a formal component. Um, so we are worried about what, how the BRICS will evolve, referring to your own analogy on the recommendations. Um, and, but I would like to think um, that the various working group recommendations would be taken forward with positivity and hope, uh, and such odes to freedom uh, would not go unheard. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Nina Ratilainen, please, from the Greens. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. We have talked a lot about democracy, and democracy is interactive. When we give something uh, uh, knowledge and uh, know-how and the possibility to use this knowledge and know-how, we all, all also get back. One important thing uh, here is the climate movement of the young people. It was started in Europe, and uh, the young people said that they would not go to school if, uh, if uh, the climate issues are not solved. Uh, many young people still do not go to school on Fridays because uh, they think that their, their voice is not heard enough. The uh, uh, recommendations of the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, need to be implemented. Uh, there is also a resolution uh, by the Parliament, which is important. Um, citizens need uh, and uh, are, they, they have to be given information on the uh, functioning of the uh, European Union. Democracy is means participation. Um, uh, and it's important that this uh, citizen uh, education, citizenship education is uh, done um, by learn, learning by doing. So people are not only passive learners, they also are active doers. Uh, often when uh, we teach uh, and give information, uh, this information is uh, very theoretical. But uh, these uh, recommendations could also be implemented in practice where those who learn would be able to also do and uh, create networks. Um, uh, I would also like to uh, talk about this uh, horrible war that, that is going on. Uh, yesterday we uh, heard from the mayors in Ukraine how they are the shield of democracy. And I think uh, there is a lot of um, demand for European values now. It's also important how people can pr promote these uh, values further. Uh, on behalf of the Green uh, Group, I would like to thank the rapporteurs and uh, everybody who is committed to these initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Fugeta, please. Mr. Bianco, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Three brief points. I would very much like to thank all our illustrious speakers. Firstly, I believe that uh, it's the EU's priority in the area of education that we combat uh, school dropouts. In my country, there is uh, compulsory schooling until the age of 16. And for four terms uh, of office, I was uh, mayor of uh, Catania in the south of Italy. It's an area where we have a lot of uh, juvenile crime and a lot of school dropouts. And I can confirm that uh, we are... Uh, we have uh, school dropouts. Uh, if, if that figure is brought down, then it automatically brings down as well uh, the uh, whole uh, juvenile crime uh, situation. And I think through our efforts in that respect, we have seen a major improvement. Secondly, a civil education. I think that is something that is absolutely essential. 
in particular in countries uh, where there is no civic uh, education uh, on the curriculum. This has to be returned uh, to make sure that people can uh, play a full part in the community. Thirdly, digital education. With the growth in uh, the ability to uh, take part uh, in uh, things remotely, uh, online, there are parts of the uh, population, in particular elderly people, who are automatically excluded. So we have to have specific instruments uh, to make sure that there is proper online education and formal education for elderly people as well. Colleagues, it's one minute the intervention and I will have to... Uh, give the floor to the next colleague. Ms. Magyar, please. Tisztelt elnök úr, biztos asszony, hölgyeim és uraim! President, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, all EU member states are democratic and operate a democratic system based on their own traditions, which is based on local and national elections. I'm proud to say that Hungary does well in this respect. Elections are organized according to rules and young people uh, turn up to vote in large numbers. We can say the same of the Conference of Europe and the accompanying event. Maybe it's not that well known, but the largest number of these events were organized in Hungary with special attention to participation of young people. This served us with the lesson that Hungarians are open to diversity and they find it very important to have sovereign states in place that cooperate and respect diversity. This is what multiculturalism means to me, respect for others' traditions but sticking with our own ones. Thank you. Mr. Karaksoni, please. Dear Vice President, President, in addition to uh, families, it's schools that are best placed to educate our young people, uh, be it about history or art. Uh, they are in the best place to uh, educate them on what it is to be European, united in diversity, and uh, they need to uh, teach young people that it is the diverse traditions that make Europe what it is. We need a European Union that is built on traditions where countries retain their traditions and identities, uh, much in the same way as the founding fathers dreamed back then. I come from Hungary and I'd like to ask the Commission to uh, respect the Hungarian legislation that protects children and also the idea that education is member states' competence in the EU. Thank you. Mr. Turk, please. Uh, Madam Schulz, uh, Mr. President, dear colleagues, uh, Thank you for your participation in the debate. Education is a key instrument in promoting European values, democratic values, and uh, local authorities. As the founder of the education institutions, uh, builds the foundations uh, for uh, active uh, citizenship. I would like to share uh, some good uh, practice examples uh, from Croatia, the country where I come from about introducing civic education. In 2016, some of the European cities uh, started introducing civic ed education in their schools, uh, developing critical uh, thinking uh, among uh, their students. It is an optional uh, class, but uh, more and more students are taking it. And uh, we should also include the European values in this. And we should actually build networks where we could share the ideas and teaching materials to promote this. Please. Dear colleagues, I believe it is very important to explain to young people what EU values and identity mean for all of us. Due to technology developments and programs such as Erasmus, young, younger generations are more connected than they used to be. But at the same time, they often get stuck, stuck in echo chambers, bubbles which merely reinforce the existing views. 
that is by facilitating proper debates, debates is essential. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to the uh, debate competition I co-organized with the help of the Committee of the Regions a little more than two weeks ago in my city of Page, South East Hungary, where students discussed sustainable economic development and the uh, future of Europe. The competition gathered more than 120 participants, divided in 28 teams coming from Hungary and Romania, who debated, uh, debated how to ensure economic growth by protecting the, protecting the environment. It was a huge hug, such as, and I think we need to organize, organize more you. events in that type across local authorities in the EU. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marusic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the European political system cannot function if the citizens don't know it, if they don't understand it. The globalization, European integration, and the U global hotspots demand that European citizens be engaged at various levels and to be able to integrate uh, diversity into their everyday lives. Education is the building block of active and informed citizenship and of democratic participation by extension. The will of the citizens has to uh, form the future of the European Union, including the participation, solidarity, and all the other values of progressive and dynamic European citizens. We also want to promote uh, uh, sustainable growth and to promote uh, peace uh, and uh, harmonic relations. We would like to empower our citizens so that they can take full part in the society to decrease uh, polarization in the society, fake news, uh, which exert pressure on our democratic uh, systems. Ms. Gilliland. Ms. Fugeta. Sono una consigliera comunale della città. I come from the city of Potenza and I'd like to tell you about a project that we've had in uh, my uh, city, in my region, uh, which is uh, providing uh, a high-level quality of education uh, on uh, conflict, promoting uh, a culture of uh, peace. And uh, we have uh, been trying uh, to ensure that uh, we provide as much information as possible about uh, peace uh, in the classroom, uh, talking about uh, concrete uh, projects, uh, trying to uh, share information about history, uh, universal human rights uh, and active citizenship. And I think that uh, this project really offers added value to uh, the experience uh, that we have uh, in schools, uh, moving uh, from theoretical uh, to more practical hands-on education. Thank you. Grazie mille. Thank you very much, colleagues, for uh, taking the floor in this very, very interesting debate. I would like to give the floor now to Vice President Suica for her reaction. <laughs> Thank you very much, President. First of all, I was uh, listening carefully what you were saying here, and it was really very, very interesting. And I want to thank you once again for your active engagement in this topic and for your active engagement in, uh, in the Conference on the Future of Europe, all over Europe on different levels, be it, be it at local, regional or national and even European level, because I heard some of 30 of you who were active in the, confer in the conference plenary and also in the working groups. Uh, regarding active citizenship, regarding uh, this uh, curriculum, I think there is, this is the only <laughs> the only proposal or recommendation which came from citizens which was totally consensual. So uh, from the very beginning, beginning uh, at any conference, any event which has to do with the Conference of the Future of Europe, everybody was uh, proposing and promoting European uh, education, European citizenship. 
even people from here, from this country, from founding, uh, from founding countries, from Belgium, from Netherlands, they said that their citizens don't differentiate between the names of institutions. They don't know what is Council of Europe, what is European Council, what is European Parliament, what is European Commission. I, I thought it is uh, uh, from the uh, new, new member states, but no, it's not the case. Even here, people don't uh, differentiate and they don't know enough about European Union. So what we, I'm sure, although uh, I'm not uh, authorized to, to tell the results of uh, our conference, which will be, uh, which will be uh, promoted, uh, presented tomorrow and day after tomorrow, I'm sure that this will be definitely one of the conclusions because we have to uh, intervene in our uh, education curricula. Of course, we have to also take into consideration that uh, education is, according to the treaty, within the competence of member states. Does it mean that we have to change the treaty? This is uh, completely a completely new issue. I don't want to, to speculate now about that. Uh, there were many questions among you. Uh, what is follow-up? In fact, this was the only question. How are you going to follow up? You know that we have uh, very strict uh, rules of procedure. You know that we, had, we have joint declaration, which is the basis of our work. And in this joint declaration, three presidents of three institutions at that time, they committed that they will follow up what citizens say. When I, uh, now I speak on behalf of European Commission. For us, citizens are at the heart of the process, and we will follow up what citizens said. So all these proposals, all these recommendations coming from working groups, coming from multilingual digital platform, which hasn't been mentioned today, but was one of the important sources uh, for, for, for the conclusions, will be taken on board. This is what I can say on behalf of European Commission. But, but as you know, this joint declaration also says that there should be consensus among uh, among three institutions and according to rules of pro procedure among four pillars, which means Parliament, Council, Commission and national parliaments. Of course, citizens should agree or disagree with uh, what we will conclude. I hope that nobody is, uh, is <coughs> crazy enough to go against citizens' proposals because the very reason why we organized this conference of the future of Europe was to come closer to citizens, to listen to their needs, to listen to their ideas, to listen to their problems, to, the, to listen to their daily concerns, because I have to repeat this again, there is a gap between us politicians, policy makers and citizens, and we wanted to narrow this gap. And this is the reason why we are discussing with them and why we are promoting deliberative democracy. Of course, participative democracy is important. You are, you are elected I was elected too on different levels. So uh, you are elected, but in order to empower us, in order to strengthen us, we call citizens to tell us what they think, what are their, da what are their daily problems. No one could have predicted at the beginning of this term of the Commission in 2019, nobody could have predicted that a uh, pandemic will come, nobody could predict maybe predict that this bloody war will come. So things are or things have been changing so fast and we have to react to it. This is the reason why I'm all the time preaching that we have to make our democracy fit for the future. It's not motto, it's the fact, it's, the, it's something which is, which is the core of this uh, democratic exercise. So I really want to thank you very much. We will follow up, uh, of course, who is going to follow up? Three institutions according to their competencies. This is what is said in joint declaration. But uh, so far as I see, many of these proposals, many of these uh, recommendations ask for treaty change. This is something, so commission is not the one who will start this procedure. We will be facilitators. We will be honest brokers in this process. But of course, council, 27 member states are the most important part, and of course our European Parliament as our, our House of Democracy. So 
uh, rest assured, we will follow up and we will do uh, what we can, of course, taking into consideration geopolitical context and everything what is going on at the very moment we are speaking now, since we are contemporaries of something which we, uh, something unprecedented which we had never, I, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined that this could, that this would happen on European soil. Believe me, I come from the country uh, where I experienced the war thir uh, 31 years ago, and I never believed that the war could happen on European soil, but this is the fact which we have to take into consideration. So thank you very much for your active uh, participation. Thank you very much for your engagement, and uh, I hope you will be, uh, in the end, you will be satisfied also with your role of the Committee of the Region in this process, and subsidiarity is definitely taken on board. For sure. Thank you very much, President Tsikostas, for your engagement and for your help and for your pushing Committee of the Regions at the, at the position where you deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President, and thank you for all your help. You have been a tremendous help for us, and I better than anyone know that in very difficult times with difficult decisions and a lot of pressure from institutions and organizations, you were there to stand up for us, uh, giving always the fight uh, on our side. And uh, this shows, as you rightfully said earlier at the beginning, that once a mayor, always a mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Vice President. The floor now to uh, the member of uh, the European Parliament, Dominic Ruiz de Vesa. Thank you very much, uh, President Chichi Costas, once again, and, and to all the members uh, that took the floor. And uh, I was uh, glad to see that uh, there is a, a consensus, I will say, also in the Committee of the Regions on the importance of uh, teaching about the European Union in uh, schools. Um, they, I will say, in a nutshell, uh, it's important that they know the origins of this project, a peace project. Uh, one of the members uh, recalled that um, the rights that the Union offers, the there is a charter of fundamental rights. We, we are citizens of the European Union, not only citizens of our member states, our obligations also it was mentioned by, I think, colleague Kaiser, um, the opportunities that the EU offers to young people, our citizens in general, and uh, the roles of the institutions. This is also important. We have heard uh, so often, uh, particularly at the time, if you remember, of the euro crisis, many people or many fellow citizens blaming Europe for austerity you know, or for things they were not happy with. But what is Europe? Huh? Uh, in, in a democratic system of accountability, citizens have to be able to assign responsibility. Well, what's the role of the parliament? What's the role of the commission? What's the role of the council? What's the role of the committee of the regions? And so on. So I think it's very clear we, we have a consensus on that. The question is how do we go about it? Mm? Uh, how can we go farther than what we are doing now? And in this regard, I'm, I'm happy that Vice President Tricha is also... Uh, supportive of this idea of uh, the curriculum. And uh, it was very important uh, when uh, uh, we look at what uh, the citizens said, as you also remind, uh, remembered, in the Conference on the Future of Europe, because this was uh, a total consensus. It, there was no polemic about it. And the recommendation of the citizens said, uh, almost literally, um, that a minimum content on EU should be taught in all EU schools, right? That was very clear uh, recommendations. So how do we go about it uh, in the context of the treaty, in the context of the national comp competencies? One other of the recommendations, which probably is very uh, radical, was to say in the field of uh, citizenship, uh, education, there has to be a shared competency between the EU and member states. I'm in favor of that but I admit that this is really a, a radical step. So this is why I think we can do much, uh, even before getting into uh, such a proposal in the context of a treaty revision, if we collectively um, agree on that minimum content that the citizens asked to be taught in the schools, and then 
I'm sure if we do that, the majority of member states will follow. Huh? Mm -hmm. So I think this is uh, my takeaway. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, President Chiche Costas for your leadership in this topic and Vice President of the Commission also, and of course, uh, Professor Inge, because I think today we are not just holding an event on this topic, but we are uh, starting the roadmap on this very critical uh, field. Thank you very much. And finally, last but not least, our uh, good friend, uh, our professor uh, from uh, Tulborg University. Um, you have the floor, Professor Zieben. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I very much uh, like to hear that you are all supporting this curriculum changes. And I would like to stress that even with curriculum changes, it is still a challenge for schools and teachers to teach about this. And I think we need, uh, there is a lot of knowledge out there about what are good teaching strategies in this respect. And uh, as you mentioned, there are many Erasmus Plus projects, other projects, which really dive into how to do it. And this how to do it is also a crucial part so curriculum changes is the first step, and then how to do it is the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, this concludes our debate uh, this morning. And uh, again, uh, many thanks to our panel and uh, all of you who participated in this debate.